He's a six foot four, bald headed chameleon. He's been a U.S. Navy officer, an Egyptian head of state, and an alien lizard. And he slipped into the skin of each character with a natural ability and ease reserved for only a few in his profession. His peers have awarded Lou Gossett Jr. an Oscar, an Emmy, and a Golden Globe for his many faces. And while he has savored success, he's also sampled devastating failure, a predictable part of the acting package. What did you call me, boy? You ready to quit now, Mayo? Ha! Ha! Understand? Yes, sir. Understand? Yes, sir. I said morning. He was a recruit's ultimate nightmare. The role of surly Sergeant Foley in An Officer and a Gentleman was originally written for someone of a different color and quite obviously a different disposition from that of mild-mannered Louis Gossett Jr. Where did the genial Gossett with the easily provoked laugh learn to kick butt? I had to go down to the Marines for a month and a half. And by the time I showed up on that set, I was like this. Uh, they thought I was nuts. But, but I worked. got the right reaction. He got the right reaction, all right, taking home an Oscar for that performance. He'd already won an Emmy for his role as Fiddler in Roots, but at one time he would have preferred honors in the professional basketball arena. You know, you could have played for the Knicks. I could have played for the, for the Knicks, but that was the same year I got offered a Racing in the Sun. So um, I was invited to the training camp up in Grossinger's. I'm in the Catskills. And I showed up up there and did pretty good for myself. I got a few elbows in the chest, and the guys were very hungry, lean, mean, angry, and taller, faster, younger. <laughs> and I said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to give you guys a break. <laughs> and I'm going to go on Broadway and work with Sidney Poitier. drink. I don't know what our excuse is. Hey, look, honey, we're going to the theater. We're not going to be in it, you know. He says when he decided to be a serious actor, the work stopped. The British had invaded Broadway. And that's when I moved to music. Wait a minute. I went to I did a little music and down in the, in the coffee shops in the 60s. You sang? I sang with a guitar. Sang this one song. Um, uh, I wrote this one song. That's pretty good. I used to sing it in the coffee shops. Don't be shy. What? Did you want to hear the song? Oh. Yes. oh. Hey, look at yonder. Tell me what's that you see? Marching from the fields of Concord. Looks like handsome Johnny with a flintlock in his hand. Marching from the Concord War. Marching from the Concord War. So I wrote this song, and uh, then I got an acting job. Gave the song to Richie Havens and went to California. Did a series, it was a, wasn't a hit, and my money started to run out. And a man is putting me out of the house. And I got the couch and things are rolling down the street, and I got $9.10 in my pocket. And the mailman, who was an actor smart enough to uh, get a job, I was, he put the mail in my mouth. And I'm looking at the envelope, and it says, you know what, music. So I drop up the couch, and I open it up, and it's a check. It's a check for about 9000 Five hundred thousand, five five hundred dollars, something like that, for that song that Richie sang in Woodstock. Hey, look yonder, tell me what's that you see? Marching to the fields of Dunkirk. Looks like handsome Johnny with a carbine in his hand. Marching to the Dunkirk War. Hey, marching to the Dunkirk War. With the residual check in hand to tie him over, Lou's acting career took off again with a string of television roles and character parts in films. He improved his hunk status by losing his hair for a film with James Earl Jones, The River Niger. I shaved it all off and my agent said, wow, have we got parts for you? And I worked ever since. More or less, after Officer and a Gentleman, Gossett resorted to taking some unusual roles to stay busy. Most Academy Award-winning actors would frown at the idea of spending seven and a half hours in makeup each day to play a role in which he is totally unrecognizable. But Gossett wanted to work, and playing a lizard-like alien in Enemy Mind was a challenge, although a painful one. He developed rashes from the makeup, and a doctor was flown into the village in Iceland where he was filming. Gossett would be her first patient. They tell her nothing. Put her in my little dressing room, and they don't tell her anything. I don't know this. So they say, the doctor's here. 
and I come running up with all this outfit on, and I open the door and I say, hi, Doc, I'm the one with the skin problem. <laughs> and she looked at me, and she started to shake, and she said, move away from the door. And the guy out of the door, she made a beeline on him. <laughs> Now, when you were growing up in Brooklyn, as you say, it was a very integrated neighborhood. Yeah. Do you think in some ways it insulated you so you were really not prepared for the world outside of Brooklyn? It prepared me for what really works. So uh, I, I knew racism. I knew about that. I knew every summer I'd get on a train and have to change from the front of the train to the back of the train in Washington, D.C. Where and were the, you going? To Athens, down here, every summer. Down Who's in Athens, in Athens Georgia? My, my grandparents, uh, brothers and sisters, and the family down in Watkinsville and, and Farmington, right outside of Athens. And I used to work with the mules and the hogs and the, and the gardens every summer, me and my cousins, because our parents worked two and three jobs a piece a day. And then when school started, we'd be back home. I know you have even been named the king of Brooklyn. What was that like, having grown up in Brooklyn and then to come back and be declared king? It was wonderful, especially this year, you know, when Brooklyn had a few... Uh, Terrible incidents. I don't remember a Brooklyn like that. I remember violence. I remember, you know, the the uh, the Nostrand Avenue stompers or something like that, and this maybe a zip gun from, or, or two, and a couple of fights. But that was one thing. What happened in Howard Beach, and what happened in, in Bensonhurst? Bensonhurst is where I used to go hang out with Sandy Koufax and play ball. We grew up together. All of those, that whole area. Um, What's, I don't know what has happened there, but a poison has happened there. It's, a, first of all, drugs. It used to be a neighborhood where if a child did something, everybody on the block, regardless of race, creed, or color, could spank that child or to chastise that child. That doesn't happen anymore. The Howard Beaches and the Benson is a is a sign of us not knowing who our next door neighbor is. And, oh, uh, true. And we have to get to know and care about what their children do and they have to care about what our children do. We have to get back to that. Now, your two boys are the joys of your life. Uh, Sati, you said it was now 16? 16, 6'5", six, size 15 foot. And playing basketball, which is a love of yours, because you had a basketball scholarship to yeah, college. Yeah, he's the big guy. He's the love of my wallet. <laughs> Gossett adopted second son, Sharon. He came up through the streets. You know, he was out of St. Louis. He was hungry and homeless and had to survive. And so his mature adult wits kind of came to the surface quicker. Gossett first saw Sharon profiled on an ABC World News Tonight story about children of poverty, reported by Karen Burns. Nikki's friend Sharon has had nowhere to live for a year. The wishes they have in 1985 are basic ones. What would you like to have if you could have anything? A place to stay. I decided I was going to do something. I was going to write a check a month so somebody would take care of him. I had no idea about bringing him into my family. And they said, okay, we found him but from the United Way, the man. And uh, so I got on the plane and went to the Chase Hotel, and he was waiting there for me with his little brown paper bag. I said, you want to live with me? And that's what came out of my mouth. And I said, yeah. And that's been history of this, so I have two wonderful sons. His most recent movie role, a mirror image of his own real-life story with his son. In Sooty and Simpson, a movie for Lifetime Network, Gossett's character Simpson is left without a family, and he is taken into the heart and life of a little girl. It's beautiful. Oh, Simpson. Lou raised his own children, Sati and Sharon, as a single parent until his marriage two years ago to third wife, actress, singer, businesswoman, Cindy James Reese. Before his marriage to Cindy, he had an incident with an ex-wife that took son Sati out of his custody and into temporary foster care. One of the black women in the station, and I'm mentioning race for a minute for a reason, she said, oh, don't you remember in Jet? when he was accused of giving cocaine to his children. Mm -hmm. I didn't remember that story. Oh, yeah. How many years ago was that? That's right, let's see. 81, maybe? It was, it was after I had shot Officer and Gentleman, and there was no Oscar, and I got on drugs. 
and I can't mention the person who tried to set that up. It was a setup, and it was I was exonerated completely. But the truth part was that I did get on drugs. I had plenty of time and no work. And um, as uh, most, and it happens with a lot of us. I was watching uh, Joan Rivers today, and the kids started at 12. A lot of people are coming out of the closet saying that they, uh, they were on and they're off. But I kept that a secret for quite a while with re resentment and anger. And uh, then I realized something. Somewhere along the line, every male member of my family died of alcoholism. And why? Because their dreams were not fulfilled, and they blamed, and they swallowed a bitter pill and drank themselves to death. This generation is the generation to clean up the act. That Those roots I don't want to pass on. And it stopped. Not that magically, not that easily. He's made it through his own times of doubt that dreams might not be fulfilled. He enjoys his lot now, enjoys his world travels and his work, which allow him to take on the clothes of a thousand characters, the faces of a multitude of humanity. Lewis is now trying his hand at producing his own projects. And when he was in town recently, he had meetings about getting a studio started here. So you may be seeing more of that chameleon-like face around town.